This is my book launch release and not just my launch week, but my launch like day event. This is the day the book came out, so this is really exciting for me. <laughs> I can't thank you enough for coming here. This is really special. I just to be able to hold this thing in my hand, not this piece of paper. That's I've done that before. <laughs> I'm gonna try and arrange it real quick. Yeah, yeah, you have to do that. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> the AC's going to blow this down a little bit. I love you. Um, Thank you. This is what I was talking about holding in my hand. Uh, this, for those of you who don't know, um, is a book. It's bound on the side. And my mom is a librarian. My dad raised me to uh, love books. And so it's such a, a great experience to have this, but also to be in Strand because I grew up coming to this bookstore. And my dad is from New York. He's from the Upper East Side. And when I was a kid, he would take me to Strand, and he would uh, bring me here. My grandma lived in the Upper East Side with him. And one birthday, I think I was like seven or eight, she told me I could have whatever book I wanted from Strand for my birthday. And it was so cool to be able to come to this amazing store and, and look at the books. And I think she was probably thinking I'd get like a coloring book or something, uh, or I don't know a paperback for 15 bucks. But I came and I came up to the rare books room <laughs> <laughs> and I, uh, I looked around for the book that had the coolest pictures in it that I could find and it turned out to be this like 1912 double leather bound set uh, of books about the Lewis and Clark adventures <laughs> for $450. <laughs> and I don't think I've ever freaked or pissed off my grandma so much as she got back, what? She couldn't believe a book cost that much money, but, but I think in the rare books room, that would probably be a pretty good bargain. So if she only knew how much money I saved her when I could have bought, like, first edition Howl or something, you know, she never thanked me for saving her the money. But that, all of that is to say that I feel like I have a relationship with this place, so I want to thank Strand so much for having me here. It's so wonderful. Um, Dion Decibels, the DJ, make some noise! <laughs> We've known each other since... You're like, a, you got a year on me, right? Uh, tw 29 for, from now, for now and then forever after this, I'm going to be 29 too. I'm actually 29 right now, but this is my final, like, most evolved life form age, so. <laughs> You're seeing me. Yeah, yeah, 12 years we've known each other. So Dion and I know each other because... When I was a teenager, I used to do spoken word poetry in San Francisco. That's my background, how I originally got into writing. Uh, and Dion was always the house DJ at the events for You Speaks when uh, all of us would go up and read our poems. So me as a 15-year-old doing poems of the competition, Dion was the one spinning the tracks in between. And so uh, way back. Now we're here. Mama, we made it. So that's pretty cool. Um, one thing that I do want to say before I launch into reading some stuff from this book. First of all, thank you for standing for this event. And it's a little bit strange for a book reading to be standing, but we'll treat it like a cross between a concert and a book reading. <laughs> and um, no, no, I won't. No crowd surfing. I don't do that anymore. <laughs> so, but what I did want to say is it's, you know, it says it in the introduction to this book. It's something that is that I thought about a lot when writing personal essays. There's something fundamentally self-serving and narcissistic about writing a collection of personal essays. And I didn't want to shy away from that or pretend that's not there. You know, I'm writing about myself the whole time. And when you have a week like we had this week with the multiple things that happened in Orlando and obviously all over the world, there's tragedies unfolding every day. This week I thought was especially, um, you know, a lot of things happened that hit really close to home for me and it was really hard and I felt very strange plugging my book and hawking it in this way. Uh, I can't not hawk it, it would be a disservice to myself and everyone who worked so hard on this book to pretend like it didn't exist and not push it when it comes out. Um, but I just want to acknowledge that self-absorption there in the essay collection, but also say why I chose to write this book and why I write in the first place. And for those of you who are writers in the room, maybe you feel a similar way. I kind of switch between poetry and rap and now prose. And for me, what's not ever been so important as the form of what I'm working in is the connection that you have with the audience. And why I got into art is because I was a kid who saw people up on stage who read books that resonated with me, not just in the epic moments and the grand moments, but in little mundane um, slice of life things where I could say, I've felt that way before. Like you as a human being having that experience and giving it to me shrinks the planet down from this incredibly large 
terrifying size to something manageable that makes me feel like I'm not alone in the world. And so to be able to do something like that with a book, the only perspective I will ever have is my own. I don't get to step into someone else's skin and see the world through their eyes. And so I did my best to try and interpret my world and my experiences in this book. I'm not reinventing the wheel. It's nothing um, that anybody's not done before, but I tried to do it as best I could. So with that being said, um, you know, I think take a moment of silence for those in Orlando, and then I'm going to launch into doing some work. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to read an essay, and I'm going to start with a fairly long one. So just prepare yourself for, you know, your quads to be burning. <laughs> if you need to bust into some squats at any point, that's fine. And if this music stand's not working, I might ask one of you guys to come up and hold the paver for me in a little bit. Yeah, you're down? You were about to say something to me before I started. I was. I was like, I was going to ask you for a hug, but you started walking. Oh, I got you. All right. Aw, aw, aw. Get it out of your system. <laughs> I also brought you something, but I shouldn't give it to you later. I don't know. What is it? It's something pretty cool. <laughs> pretty cool. Is it a liger? <laughs> is it psychedelic mushrooms? <laughs> you want to know. So does that mean it is psychedelic mushrooms? <laughs> because they won't kick in until I'm on my, like, third essay. And then you guys are going to see it get real weird. <laughs> I feel like I have to say, yes, I do want it now. Let's see what it is. What's the mystery gift? Close your eyes for me. Uh, I'm, I've been asked to close my eyes, and I'm about to receive a gift. I'm sorry, none of you. This is not socialist at all right now, by the way. I get to sit, no one else sits, and I receive gifts while you guys stand. <laughs> Fuck you. <laughs> I'm ready for my gift. I'm closing my eyes. I don't know. How, should I just, like, reach? You're gonna have, should I come over there? Should you reach your arm over I don't know how far away it is. You told me to close my eyes. If I close my eyes and come over to you, I'm going to fall off the stage. Is that part of your plan? Oh. When do I clo open my eyes? Oh, snap. Star Wars Mega Pack. 30 pouches. Are these Star Wars Gushers? They're not Gushers. They're fruit snacks. Oh, damn. Dip. You know what? This is the one chance I have to be somewhat socialist with this show. I see you. I told you it was going to be like a concert a little bit. I know it's your birthday right now. That's Matthew's birthday. He's turned 23 today. Make some noise for Matthew. Make sure Matthew gets a pair of pack of Star Wars fruit snacks. Oh, nice catch. Mazel tov. It's, is it really your birthday? How many people's birthday is it right now? Wait, really? That's Rob right there. I know you, Rob. Thanks for the support through the years. Hey, anyone else want some fruit snacks? Boom. I'm going to keep some for myself, I promise you. This is the, the best giving away free shit way to start a show. Yeah, I can't neglect that side. All right, I'm going to save some of these so that you guys don't leave in the middle of the show. Okay. It's about to get real literary in here. Lit. I know, man, I was going to avoid that joke. That's low-hanging fruit right there. Okay, this is called Good Hook. And uh, this is the first time I've read an essay from How to Ruin Everything, so. <laughs> Nothing like the first time. Good Hook. One general law leading to the advancement of all organic beings, namely multiply, vary, let the strongest live, and the weakest die. Charles Darwin. No joke. She's like a nine. Blonde, crazy body. She said to me, we could have a really good time together. To summarize, the slamming chick in the back of the plane was down to fuck. For real. <laughs> My airplane seat neighbor eagerly explained his good fortune to me with an incredulous, come on, you gotta be kidding me, eyebrow raise. In our first 30 seconds of conversation, this stranger had revealed to me that one, he was married, with two, 
an 11-month-old son back in Vermont, and three, had some very promising infidelity lined up for the next few hours. Zach, I never got his name, but he looked a little like Zach Galifianakis, <laughs> was stuck with a middle seat despite his best efforts. D just sounded like it should have been a window seat, you know? He was a squat 40-something with a thick brown beard, crinkles gathering in the corners of his eyes, wearing loose dicky blue jeans and a plain white t-shirt draped over his gut like a tablecloth. A pair of Oakleys was perched on the bent brim of his black baseball cap, embroidered in white with the word harpoon above a cartoon trout. He was a charter fishing captain, he told me, heading home from the season kickoff in Alaska. Oh yeah? I eagerly contributed. For the first time in my life, I had something to say about fishing. I was just up on the Russian River with my buddy for the sockeye opener. That ain't real fly fishing, my new friend responded. I exaggerated his inflection a little bit. <laughs> well, I admitted, I was just holding the net anyway. Zach ignored me completely, the angler angling his shoulders and legs away from me like guys do at the urinal. His body language said it all. You have nothing to offer me. Oh, Dion, we're going to do these sound effects now. Oh, that's... Uh, wait! <laughs> Ah, oh, shit. So th <laughs> this essay is, is structured so that it goes back and forth between two scenarios and there's little emblems on the page. So I thought Dion and I would do a sound effect in between and he was going to surprise me with... <laughs> so that's, that's the sound effect. <laughs> yeah, yeah, D's Nuts 2020. Yeah, Kanye West, D's Nuts 2020, your, your candidates. Uh, so are there other options besides that? The sound effect sounds. We can go by audience participation and figure out what the emblem sound is going to be. Yeah. I've never. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. No. We got that. No, we'll do a poll at the end. Okay. Let's do like two more sounds and then we'll pick from those four. This is really bad. I've interrupted the flow of the essay. Yeah. I told you it was going to be like a concert. <laughs> and then last one. Yeah, neither did I. <laughs> Welcome to the Watsky Dion Decibels book reading tour. <laughs> How to ruin everything. <laughs> Last one. Let's go between those three. So we have the one that, that he just played. Ah. Uh, by round of applause, how many of you guys want us to use that one? This guy. What about the next one? What was it? Oh, yeah, right? Yeah, something like that. We have, oh yeah, who wants that one? <laughs> Fairly popular, and then, uh, of course, we have D's Nuts at the end. Anyone like you? Okay. <laughs> My serious essay. <laughs> well, let's serious. Okay, so you have to move me into the next section now, Dion. Can I hear, well, let, yeah, let's, let's create this transition right now. Okay, I'm going to do the last line from the last section, and we're going to move into the next one. You have nothing to offer me. <laughs> the current was stronger than I expected when I dipped my rubber toe into the water. That wasn't even really a funny line. But thank you. Cootie and I wore beige rental boots, the kind that run two-thirds of the way up your thigh and tie into your belt loops instead of the fancier full trunk boots that look like astronaut pants with suspenders. Fishing under Alaska's midnight sun feels like wading through an outdoor casino. The fl fluorescence hum all night as time becomes an abstract concept. Chain-smoking grandmas feeding slot machines replaced by men in baseball hats and camo vests flicking lures into the river. It was 2 a.m., but the sun still hovered just over the horizon, soaking the sky, bouncing glimmers of light off of Cootie's reel, the metal shaft of net in my left hand, the vodka nip in my right, the two of which were making it very difficult for me to keep my balance as I carefully lowered myself from the steps metal grating into the rushing water and marched behind Cootie toward the center of the river. I tested the strength of each rock dubiously, wobbling, cursing myself for bringing my cell phone and notebook, one clumsy step from destruction. I'd lost the cap to my airline vodka, probably stuck in the throat of a salmon down river by now, so I steadied myself, polished off my drink, and pocketed the bottle, happy to discover that when I turned my net upside down, I could use the handle as a walking pole. Cootie and I splashed toward an open patch of the stream, giving the other fishermen, huddled in clusters every 20 yards, as much space as possible. The sockeye opener, 
is an annual event. People swarm from all over to fish until dawn, starting at the stroke of midnight. Cootie had fishing experience and had been interested in the salmon run, but it was pure coincidence that we happened to pull into Cooper Landing eight hours before the official start of the season. My cousin Eli, the third person on our backpacking trip, had decided to pass and catch up on sleep back at the campsite. But Cootie and I figured we'd probably never get a shot at it again, and at 11.30 p.m., we joined the crawl of cars to the riverhead. Can you believe it? I asked. We came all the way from LA to Alaska to sit in traffic. <laughs> I scanned the radio until I found a crackling country station. Every time we moved up a foot, we'd lose the sing signal, only to pick it up again with the next jolt forward. I sang quietly over the strumming guitar that I could hear through the static. Everybody. Yeah, yeah. George! <laughs> Cootie interjected. Cootie, did you realize that everybody by the Backstreet Boys fits perfectly on top of every single other pop song? <laughs> it's fucking crazy. Man, I swear to God. My bad. We finished the crawl in silence. It's thick at deliverance, a family of five announced to us on their way back up the trail to the parking lot, each of them carrying a plastic bag. Best hole on the river. We all caught out in an hour. Each fisherman with a license is allowed three fish, and no one wants to leave until they've hit their quota. After two hours inching along in the car, our minds fuzzy from the bizarre daylight patterns, we were relieved to hear that this would be a quick trip. And so Cootie unspooled his line, tied on his weight and hook with its purple and orange plumed lure, and flicked it a few feet into the river, waiting for dinner to bite. We waited. And waited. Cootie cast and recast his line as I leaned against the wide mesh of my net, its handle wedged between rocks, nothing to offer him but cheap moral support. After half an hour, I flipped my net around and leaned on the hilt, watching the current slice through the webbing, hoping one of the more remedial salmons might blunder in of its own accord. But all I caught were a couple of leaves, the river quiet except for its steady stage whisper. These nuts. <laughs> I'll give you 20 bucks to switch seats with her, Zach hissed, suddenly friendly, newly aware I was valuable to him. Zach, I now realized, was both a scumbag and an idiot. <laughs> when bordering plane seats, a person has three potential assets, bribery, the seat itself, and the power of guilt. Zach's bribe sucked and Zach's seat sucked. He was in the middle. His alleged lady love was also in a middle, and since middle seats are about as valuable as, valuable as losing lottery tickets with the shiny shit scratched off, Zach was relying on some universal bro code to sway me. Interesting offer. Should I switch from my aisle to a middle seat 20 rows back for this six hour red eye? Zach may have pictured me agonizing. Well, I have a chance to help this chill dude score, hopefully relieving him from the stress of married life and fatherhood. <laughs> At this point, it is important for me to, arrange, to explain the seating arrangement in more detail. Zach was in the direct middle of a three-row block, nine seats total. Directly in front of Zach was another empty middle seat. Zach's left-hand seatmate was an old man in glasses wearing a neck pillow and a fleece jacket, zipped all the way up to the top, the corners of his lips pulled down by the weight of decades, not necessarily in a frown, but giving the impression of one. Sitting directly behind the old man was the old man's wife, whom he'd been split up from. To the right of the wife was a middle-aged woman and her young daughter. In front of me was an athletic 19-year-old, let's call him the athlete, in sweats and a pair of huge headphones. And in front of the old man was a gym rat with a shaved head. I'll call him Stone Cold. <laughs> His broad shoulders covered by a long-sleeved crew neck that read, Fifth Annual Blue Rock Big Marlin Tournament. Stone Cold was a man with no time for small marlins. <laughs> the gears in Zach's brain turned very slowly. <laughs> hey, I'll give you 20 bucks to switch seats so I can sit next to my girl. Zach leaned up with puppy dog eyes to ask the athlete. Very sneaky, Zachary, I thought. My girl, huh? Liberal word choice. <laughs> After the athlete shook his head and laughed quietly, Zach tried the same routine on Stone Cold with the same disappointing result. Zach's rotten old carrot kept falling off his pole, but he kept tying it back on. I didn't like the idea of playing accomplice to adultery. I don't believe that there is ever a justification for deceiving someone you love. But I also hate the idea of an unfinished crossword puzzle or a Sudoku problem. And 
I drew the following diagram as we taxied down the runway and took off from Anchorage. Wait one second. Did I have this specifically for this piece? Yes, it was a planned gag. <laughs> yeah. Oh boy. Yeah, you're like at a Carrot Top show right now. I just want you to understand what's going on. So, basically, if I can remember correctly, here's the aisle. That's a good aisle, right? <laughs> Young Rembrandt. We have three rows. Hey, Dion, will you play some music while I do this? Yeah. So, like, these are A, B. That's, you gotta visualize it. Yeah. I see it. You see it, and I see you, like, spiritually. <laughs> so this is C, D, E, and this is F, G. We have, the, we have Zach right here. This is empty. <laughs> This is old man. <laughs> All right, you're getting into it. Old man's wife right here, right behind the old man. This is mom. This is daughter. <laughs> I know how to spell it on a book, all right? God, you'd be surprised how many words you realize you don't know how to spell when going through this process. Okay, mom, daughter, we have the athlete right here. I'm really sorry to you, you're just gonna have to picture this. Where are you? No, it's you. That's me, you're right. Good thing I haven't taken those psychedelic mushrooms yet. And this is the athlete, yes. And can any, does anyone remember who's in the last square? Stone Cold. Stone Cold. Very, very good. All right. So you got it. Dion, I'll let you take your own cue with that music when you want to fade out. I'm enjoying it. Okay. So now that we have the diagram up and we've wasted two minutes of your valuable time, <laughs> that's the diagram I drew. And here's what I thought. The only seats available or middles. Zach's not going to be able to split up a mom and her daughter. We might as well cross them out. We know the athlete and Stone Cold aren't going to trade their aisles for a middle, and neither am I. So there's only one possibility. Hey! I leaned over and whispered to Zach, his arms crossed in frustration, resting on the doughy chest of his shelf. The key is the old man and his wife. Right? Is that what you were thinking, too? <laughs> if you take the bald guy's seat, and he takes the old woman's seat, the old woman can take your seat, and your girl can take the empty seat. I was proud of myself. It was the perfect solution. Zach gets the girl and gets away from me. I justified the bogus morality of helping Zach by telling myself I was doing a mitzvah for the old couple. Who knows how many more flights they'll have left to share together. <laughs> yeah, I thought of that, but I heard them talking. They don't want to sit next to each other. Zach explained, they're married. <laughs> After 40 minutes without a nibble, Cootie and I started making our way downriver, in small increments at first, a step at a time in the water, then in larger chunks, getting out of the river, trekking down the path, and wading back in at a more promising looking spot. But we didn't know what a good spot was supposed to look like. Shallow, where the salmon are forced, forced toward the surface. Deep, where they gather in holes, near the bank, near the center. We guessed and failed and guessed again, the river barren of any life but us. What about down there? A group of anglers were bunched up at the river bend. From our distance, we couldn't tell if they were all in one spot or strung out a p across a quarter mile. Might as well. We stopped out of the water and walked the rest of the way down the path until we arrived at the congregation. Deliverance delivered. Fish on! Every 30 seconds, a line went tight and a flash of silver exploded from the river. 15 or 20 men jockeyed for position on a shallow ford, towing a steep drop in depth, casting into the hole. A gaunt woman in pink vinyl pants danced calmly downstream, fishing with her baby strapped to her chest. I don't think she was wearing her kid as a fashion statement 
or for early child or for early bonding develop or for early development bonding. She just really didn't have a better place to put her infant down. It was either prop her baby against a piece of driftwood on the gravel bar and let a bear snatch it to raise as its own or strap it to her chest. The baby's toes dangled a few inches above the rapids. Walk it down! Walk it down! Mom pulled back on a rod, not too hard, letting the desperate fish seal its own fate. The harder it struggled, the further it buried the barb into its cheek. The other fisherman limboed under her taut wire as she coaxed the fish downstream toward the bank, finally out of the water and up onto the gravel bar. The animal gasped in the open air, contorting its rubbery spine. She picked up a small plastic orange baton and cracked the fish's skull. It went limp instantly, and she dangled her prize, spinning slowly on its line, silver scales catching the 2 a.m. rays like a disco ball. Good hook! It was an average catch, about a foot and a half long, but good hook seemed to be like the high fives NBA players give each other after free throws, whether they swish it or air ball. There was a genuine atmosphere of camaraderie, and with the fish plentiful, the veterans weren't protective of their turf. Cootie and I edged our way toward the sweet spot. I eagerly drummed the handle of my net with my fingers, standing a few paces in back as he cast one line after another, close enough to pretend I was part of the action, far enough away to avoid a hook in my cheek. The minutes ticked by, then the hours. Everybody, I sang under my breath. Yeah, yeah. George! <laughs> Sorry. I've had that song stuck in my head for months. I leaned harder and harder against my net until I stepped absent-mindedly onto a rock that wasn't there. The top of my boot dipped below the water and a cold rush of glacier melt poured in. My teeth chattered. My competitive spirit collapsed. In the exhaustion and disorientation of Alaska's eerie perpetual twilight zone, I started to lose my grip. Cootie, I felt a tickle in my boot. I think I might have caught one. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> The seatbelt sign dinged off like a starter pistol. Zach motioned for me to allow him out, standing before he'd remembered to unbuckle, fighting against his strap. Eventually, he wriggled free and took off down the aisle with bow-legged determination. And Zach surprised me by returning again a minute later, followed by more or less the type of woman he'd described to me. A slender Malibu Barbie blonde in a tight black sweater and layered highlights, the type of haircut that takes multiple appointments. This is you, Zach directed his catch, but, well, not you, but you get it. He directed his catch by waving clumsily to the empty middle seat. She, I'll call her Nikki because she poked her head through the space between the seat backs like Jack Nicholson in The Shining, <laughs> had the wide eyes of a sockeye salmon, all eyeball, no lid, just round white golf balls popping against her black raccoon eyeliner. They are the eyes of the terrified, the naive, or the devious, I tried to figure out which category Nikki fell into as she corkscrewed her blonde mop through the cushions every few minutes to pick up her thrilling conversation with Zach. What are you doing? <laughs> Hanging out. I'm bored. <laughs> Nikki snaked her hand back and pawed around in the general vicinity of Zach's lap. He wiggled his knees and squirmed when she opened her fist to offer him a few Cheez-Its. Unsure what to do with his hands, Zach alternately laid them flat, palms down on his tray table, twiddled his thumbs, and stroked Nikki's back meat through the seat crack. I started a Ben Stiller movie as a cover for my eavesdropping and spied on them from under the low brim of my baseball hat. When the flight attendant came around, Zach ordered a double whiskey ginger with Canadian Club and, Ni and Nikki got a Bacardi with Diet Coke. Did you get one or two, she asked Zach, who held up two husky fingers and smirked proudly as they doinked their plastic mini bottles together. I'll watch a bit of the movie, then bother you again, Nikki said ejecting her head from the seat back. But when I looked up from the end of my movie, it wasn't Zach, but rather Stone Cold who had her attention. And he fiddled with the fast forward on Nikki's screen, aligning their Louis C.K. comedy specials to the same point so they could watch in tandem. I love nature shows, National Geographic or Planet Earth, where you get to follow the breeding and hunting habits of animals in the wild. Most of these shows are shamelessly preferential to certain species while vilifying others. You can, by sound alone, easily tell the heroic lions with their stirring brass buildups from the majestic eagles and their smooth violin swells from the nasty ferret who sneaks in to rob the nest accompanied by a bit of minor key oboe noodling. <laughs> it's cheesy, 
but it's comforting. You know, the music tells you exactly who to root for. I knew Stone Cold's arrival on the scene deserved a motif of its own, but I'd lost my bearing. I didn't know whose side I was supposed to be on or who had the inside lane. Stone Cold won on location and looks, but Zack had the history. And doesn't good old-fashioned, dishonest hard work count for something? <laughs> After a few minutes, Nikki leaned over and whispered into Stone Cold's ear. Then the two of them stood up together, along with the hairs on my arm. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> that was amazing. <laughs> for fish that seemed to be everywhere, they didn't seem to be anywhere. They're camouflaged, Cootie explained. Dark like the river, if you're looking down from above. Sparkling, you know, like the sun through the water, if you're looking up at its belly from below. After six years knowing Cootie, his patience shouldn't have surprised me. I thought back to his composure earlier that week at the dive bar on the Homer Spit, Alaska's bitter end. I'm buying you a drink, a stumbling drunk had offered him. Do you know why I'm offering you a drink? The barfly slurred, shaking Cootie's hand. Because you're black, and that doesn't matter to me. <laughs> Cootie shook the guy's hand. We both know Cootie. <laughs> this is my drummer, by the way. Cootie shook the guy's hand and downed the whiskey. Then he and Eli left the bar to get some food, and I started drinking with an 80-year-old man who'd been watching the NBA Finals by himself. Turned out he'd been on the ground in Houston for all the Apollo and Gemini missions in the 60s as a member of the NASA reconnaissance team. Oh, Buzz? The man said to me confidingly. On a tiny bar TV, Stephen Curry missed a rare free throw, and his teammates leaned in to slap palms with him. Funny story the man continued. After Neil took his first walk on the moon and Buzz got called to the surface, he wasn't really ready for the walk and he had to pee real bad. After the mission, the team, you know, the, the team was analyzing the suits, you know, and thought the liquids pouch had malfunctioned. But really, Buzz, you know, he didn't, he didn't want to lose steps on the moon. So he didn't bother to fix her up. He just went ahead and pissed all down the side of his leg. So just think about that and see if it changes your impression. Yeah, next time you see a picture of him in a spacesuit saluting the flag, Buzz Aldrin, Explorers Club, American hero, had piss sloshing all around in his boot. <laughs> it's a true story you told me. I smiled, recalling the man's story in the frigid, frigid Russian river, the glacier water at my feet transforming into the piss of the second man on the moon. I daydreamed about the lunar landing and imagined gravity diminishing, inflating myself with a sense of duty and honor. Wait. <coughs> And then it happened fast. <laughs> Stone Cold stepped to the side to let Nikki pass. Zack's eyes widened as she headed toward the bathroom, sensing a glimmer of opportunity. He fumbled to stow his tray tailor table, and Zack lurched past his tangled headphone cord over my lap and down the aisle after her. Zack and Nikki were gone from their seats for 15 minutes. Fish on! Fish on! Cootie was 10 feet downstream before it registered that he was the one with the fish on the line. I rushed in back of him, net poised anxiously. Walk it down! Then he backed calmly and silently toward the bank as I trailed behind him. I did my best to look useful, waving the net around a little bit to give the impression of action. Good hook! Finally, he dragged the writhing fish up from the gravel into the air and dropped it into my net as it muscled in vain against its confines. We smiled at each other and high-fived, and then we paused. I'll do it, I said. I thought about it a while while we were in the river. The fish was going to die no matter what, and I didn't want to go down as the guy who held the net. You sure? I picked up a flat rock from the bank as Cootie stepped on the fish's side, lifted the rock above my head, and swung. But my arm hitched a little on the way down. I let go of the rock at the last minute, half hammering and half throwing it as if cruelty could flow like electricity. From my fingers, through the stone to the fish's skull, as if by letting go of the rock at the last minute, I was letting my guilt dissolve into the air. It'll be the rock that kills the fish, not me. But the rock wanted no part in the murder and dodged left, missing the brain. I threw the stone a second time and connected. A teaspoon of blood splattered the gravel, but the fish kept fighting. I threw the rock a third time, and the struggling finally slowed, like the salmon was running out of batteries. I sighed and dropped my weapon. It was finally time to go, but Cootie gave me a pleading look that made my stomach drop. 
now that I caught one, I mean, I might as well try. After three hours waiting for our first fish, Cootie had decided that we needed to catch out. <laughs> what a slut! <laughs> I couldn't help thinking of Zach. <laughs> I didn't ask him what went down in the bathroom. I didn't so much as invite a suggestive eyebrow raise. I figured it was better left to my imagination. But after they came back from the powder room, Zach and Nikki's PDA soared to new heights. He spread his legs a little wider, his anxiousness having turned to self-satisfaction, and every few minutes an arm crept back like a squid tentacle and the happy couple hooked index fingers. Their love affair faded fast. Stone Cold was helping Nikki with her screen again, and somehow she'd accidentally switched her entertainment system's language preference to Arabic and couldn't locate her language button since that was now in Arabic too. But Stone Cold fixed the problems and synced their screens up to a new crappy Kevin Hart movie. They howled together as Kevin worked himself into one wacky slapstick scenario after another, and Nikki knocked back a Bacardi and Coke off a stone cold stray table. Tray table. <laughs> cool. <laughs> Cootie, injected with a cocktail of testosterone and optimism, splashed back into the river while I took on the important job of babysitting our dead fish. I'd seen the, the other fishermen stringing their salmon out on the bank, floating their haul in the shallows while casting their rods. I assume they did it to keep their catch fresh, or maybe they wanted to give them one last ride in the old river. I didn't have any tie line, so I let our dead sockeye bob near the surface in the net's webbing, wedging its handle under a rock. Then I noticed the dead salmon's rib ribcage rising and falling a hair, and I saw its dead, salad tongue shaped beak open and close, and then again, its dead, unblinking eye staring pitifully up at me. Shit. <laughs> Our dead salmon was alive. <laughs> I pulled the net out of the river and onto the bank and found a thick branch of driftwood between the boulders. I'd failed before because I was timid, and timidity is its own form of cruelty. I said a short apology, took a guess at where the salmon's brain was, and swung the branch down hard. The smell was unmistakable. Betrayal. Nikki Prairie dogged over the seat and smiled at Zach but her expression was obviously plastic, and as the minutes passed, the tentacle stopped creeping back. Zack battled his fatigue, a sailor on night watch, while Nikki continued to make regular recon missions, her smile flatter, her lips pinched tighter, her pupils darting more suspiciously with each checkup. It was increasingly clear that Nikki wasn't stopping by to flirt with Zack. She was checking to see if he was still conscious. As Stone Cold's fingers danced across Nikki's screen, Zack tried to stay awake by firing up a solitaire game, picking cards by grabbing the top of Nikki's seat back and mashing the screen with his thumbs. He squeezed the seat hard, neck veins swelling, sausage fingers landing with a thud, his wedding band catching in the reading light the sleeping old man had left on. I doubt Zack left his ring on out of reverence to his wife. He couldn't have removed it if he wanted to. His finger fat had absorbed it into his flesh, locking it in place. Eventually, Zach couldn't fight anymore. He passed out and slumped forward, his forehead resting on the solitaire screen, and Nikki dropped her act, snuggling into Stone Cold's shoulder and spreading her complimentary red fleece blanket over their laps. My mind raced wildly. <laughs> what could possibly be going on under that red blanket? I was so excited to stand up and spy from a better angle that I forgot to put my tray table down and spilled orange juice all over my seat. But I ignored the mess and strolled down the row, doing exaggerated calisthenics, letting my gaze drift to Stone Cold's lap. It wasn't the hand job I'd been hoping for, <laughs> but there they were, <laughs> fingers intertwined. I'll take the feeling of changing out of wet socks over an orgasm most days. <laughs> my mood had 180'd by the time I pulled on a dry pair. By now it was real morning, the Kenai River surging by our campsite in wide, brilliant aquamarine. After two rainy days, the sun had finally broken through the clouds, although even under a gray sky, the Kenai, owing to its mineral content, still sparkled like polished jade. I suppose I've gotten used to a world where the sun's rays have to battle through a heavy filter of smog, so Alaska, crisp and loud, like an overexposed photo, feels fake to me. Cootie appeared from behind the bear locker carrying the gleaming fillets, the color of grapefruit meat, as Eli fired up our double burner propane camp stove. Our pan was big enough to cook one piece at a time. The skin still clung to one side as Eli carefully laid a fillet in the hot oil. The meat sizzled, 
its bright red fading to a dull pink, the edges of the cut curling up slightly. When Eli decided the fish was cooked, he teased a chunk of the flaky pink salmon into his mouth and laugh moaned with a tone that said, it is stupid how good this tastes right now. <laughs> Fuck! I plopped down in the pool of orange juice I'd spilled while getting up to spy, cursing as the sticky liquid dampened my underwear. The old man had fallen asleep with his paperback novel open in his hands. His head lolled back, his mouth gaped. The only proof he was alive his occasional, faintly rasping inhalation. His reading lamp, a single bright spotlight in the otherwise dark cabin, shone down on the sleeping couple, heads leaned together. A blonde tuft of Nikki's hair frizzed out where Stone Cold's bald skull had blasted her with static electricity. <laughs> I think for the rest of this, I'm just going to do a little like pause moment when we, because it gets faster and faster between sections. But thank you, Dion, for doing that. You, you, you rule. Yeah, yeah, give it up for Dion. <laughs> Eli handed me a plate and I lifted a fork full to my mouth wondering what kind of music cue a nature show producer would sink under our breakfast. I like to think something brassy and triumphant that implied perseverance. But I also knew from the guy who rented us the fishing boots that the Russian was stocked artificially each season from a salmon hatchery at the riverhead, significantly undermining the ruggedness of the sockeye opener. So maybe it might have been better matched with a bit of spooky theremin wailing or some evil drums of war. But all I heard was the sound of chewing and swallowing, the river, and the Backstreet Boys song still throbbing in my head as I ate. I know I shouldn't have pitied this pervy, selfish father, but I guess I've got a weakness for losers. It was easier to despise Zach when I thought he had the upper hand. I was, however, thoroughly impressed with Nikki, who, on one domestic flight, had presumably managed to join the Mile High Club and fallen in love with another hunkier guy. Good hook, Nikki. <laughs> We wiped the corners of our mouths with our sleeves and crammed our trash into the bear-proof garbage can. Nikki and Stone Cold exchanged phone numbers right before our wheels hit the tarmac in Atlanta, jolting Zach awake. Then we returned our fishing gear, our boots, Cootie's rod, and my net, on our way out of Cooper Landing and headed back home to catch our flights from Anchorage. And no one said a word to each other as we filed off the plane, light jazz piping in through the tinny speakers. Thanks. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it. This is really fun to do and such a different experience for those of you who might have seen my spoken word shows where the words tend to go really fast. I'm trying really hard to slow it down a little bit. Um, but I don't know how much time we have left and how your legs are doing. That's a question. What your patience is like. Well, I, that's okay. I'm not going to repeat it just because I don't want to dwell on it. But thank you, and thank you, and I guess what I'll do is um, I'll read another shorter essay. Cause that one, I wanted to get the long one out of the way, and I uh, have another one that I condensed for time a little bit. But I'll probably finish that one, answer a couple questions, and I'm sticking around as long as anyone else is sticking around to say what's up. So um, other than that, I don't really have anything to say except for just thank you guys for showing up so much. I'll get to a little bit more mushy stuff later. I'm going to throw out a couple more packs of Star Wars gummies right now. Oh, the back of the room. Right over there. You want one? Hell yeah. Yeah, you do. All right. And I have a couple more for afterwards. But for now, serious writing. And I also know that this stand is going to betray me, so I'm going to hold this in my hand. You know, I, I really appreciate that, Hannah. H by the way, hello, how are you? She came to my poetry workshop that I taught in Harlem this year, so good to see you again. How are you? I'm fan-fucking-tastic. I don't know if you could tell, but I feel great. And uh, this essay is called What Year Is It? And it's a little bit shorter. It's hard to tell what year it is in Heim Palm, where Aunt Marion and Uncle Jack's raw wood cottage is buried deep in the California's coastal range. Two weeks from now, the worst forest fires in decades will rage across the Trinity Alps, turning acres of century-old pines into spent matchsticks. Our family will cry and wring our hands and wonder how we'll cross the suspension bridge to the cabin when it's turned to cinder. But then the 50-foot flames will peter out just at the base of the hill and retreat, and the house in Heim Palm will stand to see another summer. For now, though, I float in the deep swimming hole near the cabin, 
toes poking above the placid water, staring upward at the graying bridge silhouetted against this bright blue backdrop. Serene. What year is it? A faint voice asks. I'm lying on my back, bobbing up and down as fluorescent lights race by. How many fingers am I holding up? Hmm, I puzzle, a mess of digits advancing out of the fog toward me. That's a tough one. Two? Good job, buddy. Now can you tell me what year it is? No. I realize, no, I can't. We have to give him a spinal tap, the doctor declares, jogging alongside my rolling bed. In case it's meningitis. 2001, I recall suddenly motivated. I look down to see I'm wearing my navy and gold San Francisco Unified School District gym uniform, an IV in my arm, knees scraped and bloody, thighs spotted with fresh bruises. The fog gives way to a searing migraine. My jaw muscles are locked. The sides of my tongue chewed meat, burning as I probe my mouth to find slices of dead skin hanging on the inside of each cheek. The last thing I remember is running the mile in gym class, the official one that determines whether or not George W. Bush will mail me my coveted fitness certificate <laughs> with the sweet gold foil stamp on it. I remember pumping my legs as hard as I could, making my hands sleek and aerodynamic, desperate for the athletic approval of a warmonger. I don't remember finishing. Waking up from a seizure is a bit like being born. Everyone else runs around the hospital freaking out, but you slept through all the drama. You open your eyes to a world you can't make sense of. Information comes slow, until, out of the mist, a faint voice asks what year it is. And before you can come up with the answer, you conjure your first word, fuck. <laughs> then think, not again. After my second seizure two weeks later at the Japantown bowling alley, my new neurologist puts me on a medication called Depakote. For the first few months swallowing the little blue diamond-shaped tablets, I had the hat of a fat little boy on a frail body, cheeks chipmunked. I want to sleep all the time. On car rides, I sit and stare indifferently out the window, never too happy, never too sad, which makes sense when I find out Depakote doubles as both an anticonvulsant and a mood stabilizer prescribed for bipolar disorders and depression. This revelation pisses me off, and I fight my parents hard. It just doesn't seem right to swallow a handful of mystery pills engineered to rewire my brain. What's the point of getting cured if I end up a zombie? It comes down to what you would rather put up with, Mom says. The symptoms are the side effects. It's no family secret that Mom's Aunt Polly, who died in 1945, wasn't simply having the fainting spells described in old letters from her mother. But those were the days when epilepsy could be legally punished with forced sterilization. And Polly was unmedicated when she fell and hit her head on her freshman dorm bathtub at Sarah Lawrence. She'll be 17 forever. Epilepsy is known to have a hereditary element. And I'm proud of my connection to great Aunt Polly's spectral legend. Although seizures, in and of themselves, aren't generally dangerous, there are noteworthy exceptions. Seizures beget more seizures, and status ellipticus, a dangerous condition in which many episodes follow one and another in rapid succession, can be deadly. But for the most part, it's the rest of the sharp and rigid world that wants to drown you, knock your teeth out, cave your skull in when you're going down. After starting my pill regimen, I develop a new consciousness, at all times wondering, what am I near? What would it do to my body if I fell on it or into it right now? I learn you can't trust coffee table corners, rooftop edges. You can't trust urinals either. Massive grinning underbites that would get a good laugh out of leaving me to be discovered unconscious, pants down, molars scattered across the linoleum. Hard things, tall things, and wet things. Double-crossing murderers. Bathtubs, both hard and wet, are porcelain caskets. For a while, we crack the door during my bath so my parents can rush in if they hear splashing. Then I switch to showers altogether. Can you tell me what year it is? A faint voice asks as I bob up and down, lying on my back. Fuck. 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 When I can lift my head, I see that I'm still in my gym clothes, a pair of Nike shorts and a sweaty white t-shirt. George. What year is it? 2008, I reply, re recollecting that Barack Obama was elected president. Nope. Man, could it be 2009 already? George, it's 2014. How many fingers am I holding up? 
My head is propped up on a pillow, neck craned at enough of an angle to see three men, one whom I recognize and two who I don't, a hazmat box on the ambulance wall. Details float back to me slowly, leaving my apartment in Los Feliz, the Easton gym, running on the elliptical machine, sweat pouring down my temples. Seizures are triggered by different traumas for different people. Lack of sleep, dehydration, the stereotypical flashing lights, anything that stresses your body and overheats your brain. It's clear now that one of my triggers, aggravated by dehydration and fatigue, seems to be exercise, specifically long distance running. My first breakthrough seizure was running the mile, and with the second breakthrough triggered by the elliptical machine, I consider that a higher power may be screaming, STOP EXERCISING! I CREATED YOU TO BE SOFT AND SCRAWNY! But I concede later that there may be something more fundamental to my character at work. Running may pop the bubble, but it's anxiety that builds the pressure. The tension's been a part of me for as long as I can remember. A feeling of restlessness, a density of time, a sense that everything must be accomplished before it's too late. The seizures come at those moments when I press too hard, when I can't remind myself to breathe, when I can't lean back and accept life as it comes. The week following my breakthrough seizure in LA is tough, particularly because my license has been revoked, and unless you happen to live and work along the route, Los Angeles, where it could take three hours to get from the east side to the beach, has possibly the lamest bus system in the country. I hate the dependency of asking for rides. It's a regression, relegated again to the back seat on family road trips, staring indifferently out the window. But it is funny, I have to admit, looking around the 704 bus in my rollerblade liners, skid row burnouts asleep in the back row, runaways headed to the Venice boardwalk, Mexican mothers with young children on their way to and from work. My memory is a sieve, and in the immediate fallout of a seizure, I was annoyed with myself, but unsurprised to realize that, after skating two miles to the bus stop and searching my shoulder bag, I'd forgotten my shoes at home. But I felt a little bit in the right place, trudging home through the Chewbacca and Spider-Man impersonators in my styrofoam skate boots, just another lunatic at Hollywood and Vine. The odds of having a seizure at any given time are pretty low. But floating alone in the Heimpalm swimming pool, it does cross my mind. No one would hear me. I just taste copper in the back of my mouth, enjoy that warm weightlessness, soak up one fading view of the Trinity Pines, and no one would ever ask me what year it is again. It's a self-indulgent thought, but it builds a bridge to my parents and my mind. Their jokes about aging and AARP memberships are getting a little more morbid and a little less funny. The truth that anyone can die at any moment, including me, including right now, reminds me of a conversation I'd had up at the house with mom and dad that felt less like a talk between parents and son than of one between old colleagues. What age do you see yourself as, dad? I'd asked him. Ah, the continuity theory of personal identity. Jesus Christ, I immediately regretted asking. <laughs> <laughs> I'd have to say in my early 30s. You know, maybe it sounds silly, but I still feel like I have these endless possibilities in front of me. It doesn't sound silly to me, I recall replying before swimming over to the bank of loose shale to dry off in the sun. I catch my reflection in the water, pieces of me plagiarized from the past. Dad's nose, mom's chin, her dad's hair, his sister's brain, and look up to admire the scenery while I can. Thank you. Thanks, guys. You say one more, but that's the shortest thing that I had. So maybe what I'll do, I mean, I know we're getting on in time. Um, I guess I'll just say a couple more brief thank yous to Strand, to my friends who are here. I've got friends from high school and college and from beyond. Thank you to you guys for showing up. It really means a lot to me, so I appreciate you. Can you give it up for my homies and for San Francisco <laughs> representing in this motherfucker right now? We also have Salt Lake City, Utah in the house, so shout out to Gina. Um, thank you to the Gwizdowskis. I don't know where you are, but my uh, main director of photography is a guy named Alan Gwizdowski, and his parents are in the house right now. And I believe, are you celebrating a 60th birthday right now? Yes, sir. Damn, so give it up for Mr. Gwizdowski's 60th birthday. <laughs> this man got shouted out 
on stage by Tower of Power like two weeks ago, so I don't think I can really top that, but happy birthday and thank you for uh, being you and creating a freaking talented son who's the man. And thank you to everybody at Plume who's here, uh, Kate Napolitano, my editor, Mark Gerald, who helped the book get set up for me, um, Jonathan Bricks, who's been so instrumental for me, Melena Brown, the publicist for the book. Um, you know, it can sound a little corny when you go through a laundry list of people when you're hearing folks do those speeches, but really what you're doing is you're thanking the people who uh, don't get to be on stage, who worked so hard behind the scenes to make it happen. So I just want to thank you guys seriously for making this book a reality for me. It's not something I take for granted, and wherever you are in the room, I appreciate you so much. So give it up for them. <laughs> do you want decibels one more time? The staff at Strand. And I intend to answer a couple more questions before I leave, so I'm not done done yet, but a couple housekeeping things I've been asked to mention. There are t-shirts for sale in the back of the room. They say, let's ruin everything. And I printed like 200 of them. I'm not gonna print them again, so if you want them, they're there. If you don't want them, we're still friends. <laughs> and other than that, I have a lot n more new material on the way after this book too, and I'm, I'm not, I can't make an announcement yet about it, but stay tuned, because uh, I, you know, I've been living in New York since September. It's another reason that this gig is so appropriate is because I moved to Clinton Hill from LA in the fall and I came to work on new material. I, I've been off the map for a little bit and so I have this book project obviously and, and just keep your ears to the pavement because there, there are other things brewing as well. <laughs> I've also been told to say, please pay attention to the, um, there's going to be a signing afterwards. If you feel like sticking around, I'm going to stay here as long as it takes. And there's going to be some like instructions shouted out about where to go. So please uh, try and honor those. So people don't get like stuck and becomes like a triangle shirtwaist factory situation here. <laughs> too soon, too soon. <laughs> Can't make triangle shirtwaist jokes. I tried to make a teapot dome scandal joke the other day and I got booed off the stage. That was a pretty nerdy joke just then. <laughs> It's just, it's in your history books. It's like, so, yeah, I don't know. I went to a public school that had history books from like 1975, so it's probably not relevant anymore. <laughs> but I think that's all the things I was supposed to say. So does anyone have any questions about anything, about the writing process or life or, you know, food recommendations? Netflix recommendations. What recommendations? Netflix recommendations? What am I watching right now? Um, I don't know. I mean, I'm watching all the same things everyone else is. I'm on Game of Thrones. I like Silicon Valley. I love Better Call Saul. I think it's such a brilliant show. Uh, do you watch that one? You gotta, Better Call Saul is a slow burn. It's, it's hard because like you watch Breaking Bad, which is so explosive every episode, and Better Call Saul is, provides a different type of gratification. But it's so smartly written, it's so well directed, and, and it pays off, I promise you. And Bob Odenkirk, what a nuanced, like, kind and funny dude, right? Yes. Yeah, right, Sam? I was like, yeah, yeah, Odenkirk. Uh, yeah, those are my recommendations. Yes, sir. What made me take a break from music and write a book was the question. Um, that's a good question. I, I had an interesting, that's such a bad word to use for a writer. I, I had a, a very roller coaster couple of years in good and bad ways. I mean, I, for those of you who follow my work, you might know that I had this like long standing dream to play a venue in San Francisco called the Fillmore. And I, on 2013, so I went as a kid and I, every, time I got a chance, yeah, I went to see Charlie Tuna, I saw Jurassic 5 twice there, I saw Atmosphere, I saw The Roots, I saw Jamie Cullum, I saw, I don't know, I went to like probably 15 concerts at the Fillmore, and, and it was like my mecca, it's where I went to be inspired and to, you know, see the, the artists that I love the most, and so my dream was always to play the Fillmore, and when I got to do it in 2013, it was an extremely moving, like, important moment in my life, but it was really the only concrete goal I'd set for myself. I, I wasn't, I'm not really, I never set out to be a pop star, be on the radio. It's not the kind of music that I try to create. Uh, what I wanted to do was play the film more and I got to do it and then I looked up and I kind of thought like, well, what next? What do I want to do? And, and for me, it's never been about increasing the scale of what I do. After the film more, like I knew that playing bigger venues wouldn't lead like to the equivalent increase in happiness for me or fulfillment. And so I was just looking for new ways to be creative and, and what came along with a territory for that with a book was being away for a while because it's just such a slow burn process. It's not like the instant, you know, the 
in comparison, instant gratification of putting out music, even though that takes a while. But uh, yeah, I'd, I've, I grew up on books. I was listening to my parents read me books before I even had a choice in the matter when they were reading things to me. So it's just part of who I am. Um, I love to read. As my mom, with, as a librarian, you know, to, to be able to do this was a, a long time goal. So pursued the opportunity and I felt like I was at a point in my life where I was willing to maybe accept that I wasn't going to be gaining the momentum that, you know, to keep feeding the content machine of putting stuff out. So it's tough because people, when you disappear on the internet for like two weeks, people wonder where you went. And I didn't put out anything for a year and a half. And I don't know, just pursuing, pursuing the thing that I wanted to. Like uh, Next, I, I want to write a novel. And I've been told by my agent, it's not very marketable or... or <laughs> profitable, but Mark, I swear to you, I, I can write a really good novel. <laughs> It'd be so good. Think we're, we're making that Hunger Games money, man. <laughs> but yeah, I don't know. I just like, if you, I think as a writer, when, when you have something that you want to pursue creatively and that's, and you find yourself excited to go to your pen and pad or your, your word processor, you have to pursue that impulse, whether or not it's like what's marketable or what's going to get you to the next level of your career. I, I just think the impulse to pursue is what you most want to write. And that's how I felt about this book. Yes, sir. Uh, well, two, two things. Sure, don't worry. Uh, one is, uh, is your life actually as interesting as you portrayed in the book? And second of all, <laughs> where's your favorite place in like, Brooklyn for food? Favorite place in Brooklyn for food and is my life... Did he ask you guys the question? <laughs> uh, Hannah said roller coaster, I think. Is that... Roland Roaster. Roaster. By Coney Island. It's really great. One of my favorite spots by Coney Island. <laughs> Try Nathan's out there too, by the way. Don't get the hot dogs, I'm vegetarian. Just get the buns and a little mustard. <laughs> Unbelievable. Uh, I don't know, good food in Brooklyn. I like a place called Sage. There's a place called 12 Chairs that's an Israeli restaurant that's super bomb. Uh, I don't know, you guys are locals, so I'll let you guys come up to this gentleman and give him food recommendations, more of them. There's a, a burrito spot called Soshidal that's by my house that as a Californian, I'm supposed to hate all Mexican food in New York City, but I actually think it's pretty good. I mean, yeah, Dion has never even eaten there, and he's like, fuck that shit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I lived at uh, Fulton and Grand, so it was, uh, it was a lot of good food around there. And the other question was, is my life as interesting as it is in the book? I, I consider this a pretty mundane piece of nonfiction, like, in terms of what kind of explosive things happen in it. I, I mean, that story about the, the plane was like... I saw two people acting weird and I spied on them. <laughs> Nothing really crazy happened. I think, I think the thing about nonfiction that makes it compelling as someone who's only very briefly been involved in the genre is attention to detail and really honoring the moment. And when I wrote my book proposal, I proposed to aspire to something like a David Sedaris type of collection. And I'm aware we're in a bookstore, like that's an extremely high bar to try and leap over. And if I've been like, you know, hit my knees on that bar, I'd be really happy with that. But what, why, why I think David Sedaris is so good at nonfiction, one of the reasons is because he's like a journalist of his own life, basically. Like, the man has written um, essays about his process and he carries around for years, for decades, he's carried around notebooks uh, annotating everything that happens, no notating, you know, like he would make a note on the shirt you're wearing and the pattern of your shorts and, um, you know, the, the slight expression that you're making right now. And the way that you're sort of bobbing back and forth and looking at me coyly and, and like everything everything would have a descriptive term attached to it and and so then when he went to write his essay and he said oh that one moment with him you know like like that fits into the narrative that i want to write right now he wouldn't have to invent it it would be a part of the fabric of his life and he could go and catalog it because it really happened because he took notes on it and because he took notes on the details and he wouldn't have to invent any details so the richness of it that is already right there for him so I think that if, you, if you're interested in doing something like this kind of forum, what I would recommend is to really write down what happens to you all the time. And one of the drawbacks to that, and a reason that I don't know, uh, I know, this, with, with apologies to the people from the book team who are in the back, I don't know if I could, if I could really be a nonfiction writer for my whole life, is, is that takes a toll on your life. You really need to be somebody who's viewing yourself almost, uh, you're, 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 you're an observer observing yourself in the world. And that can remove yourself from the, the just experience of feeling the world around you. Uh, so it's got its drawbacks, but you know, I really think if this is something you want to do, you got to write it down fast and in as rich detail as you possibly can. Yeah, hey, sir. Um, yeah, you. <laughs> sir, what's your name? I feel bad saying, yeah, you. <laughs> Shakit. Shakit? Yeah. Right on. What's up? Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, what's the meaning of life? <laughs> oh my god. Okay.
Okay, I'm going to answer that question last. <laughs> and I'm going to answer one more before that, and then we're going to go. Uh, I haven't asked you guys in the back. You're standing up and down, jumping up and down and pointing at someone else. So what's your question, and then I'll answer the meaning of life. <laughs> Okay, well, great way for me to divide the room. <laughs> My opinion on religion. <laughs> uh, that'll actually sort of fold into Shakib's question. Is it with a P on the end? Or sh with a B, Shakib's question. So I'm non-religious in terms of being like Christian or Jewish in a traditional way. My dad's Jewish, really heavy stress on the ish. My mom is <laughs> Protestant and very vaguely Protestant. So I was raised in a non-religious household and it was really frustrating for me actually when I was a kid because some of the things that, that, that are present in my book, these, like when I mentioned the density of time in the epilepsy essay, and I talk about it in the first essay that I wrote, I've always felt like time is progressing so fast. We only have one shot at this life. And it's sad to me because I really like living and I like being on the planet. I don't, I don't, the f what do we fear more than the unknown? I, I can't deny that I'm scared to leave this thing that I love so much. And so every day I, f I feel the little hourglass drops ticking by. And when I asked my dad when I was nine years old, what happens when we die? He looked me in the eye and said, I don't know. And I, I was so angry at him for that because I felt like he wasn't giving me answers and that, that he was failing me as a father because he wasn't telling me how to see the world. And in retrospect, I appreciate that so much because it was basically him being willing to trust me at a very young age with the truth, with, with his interpretation of the truth. And he, and, and I think he sees it in much the same way that I do, which is there's so much that our human, tiny human brains are not equipped to understand. I don't understand how we got here, why we got here, what our bodies are, what are the, I don't know what the meaning of life is, Shakib. I have no fucking idea. <laughs> I don't know any more than you do. But, but I, what I do know is that is that I is that I don't know, and I like being here, and uh, and w and I gain my feeling of spirituality comes from my connection between other people. When I can feel like two people understand each other, that's a moment that can't be explained to me by chemicals and science and everything that I learned uh, in that branch of my education. It's it's those intangible emotional moments where I feel something that could be described as God. I'm I'm vaguely spiritual. Um, the, the books that always resonated with me most when I was feeling anxious were Buddhist texts about meditation, and, and I, I almost don't consider them religious, but more just strategies for dealing with the world and living in the present moment. So, no, I'm not particularly religious. No, I have no fucking idea what the meaning of life is. Uh, but I do believe in a human's capacity to experience beauty and love and connections between people. And that's a great segue, because that's sort of what I was hoping to accomplish in the book, is just tell stories with that little underground river running through it. So thank you guys very much for coming to this event. I appreciate you, and I'll be sticking around. Have a good one, guys. Peace out. DJ Dion Decibels one more time. Thanks, guys.